wait for the fire truck to go by. <laughs> it is a tough thing for a firstborn child when a new baby enters the picture. It kind of rocks their world a little bit, I think. This child who has been the center of their parents' universe, who has had all of their undivided attention to themselves, who has had two doting adults who can kind of tag team and make sure that this little one has all of their needs tended to quickly, suddenly has competition. Baby number two comes along and all of a sudden they're not the only one there. Now there are two and two parents hopefully. And what the firstborn usually finds, at least this was a case in my household, as I have had my children come along, is that the baby tends to be the one that gets the attention first. As hard as parents may try to make sure that they give the same amount of time and attention and love and affection to the firstborn, the reality is that the baby needs things faster usually. And they can't always rush to the toddler, in my case. I know not everybody has kids that are close in age. But the toddler suddenly finds that they have to wait and they have to share. And all of the things that they have come to expect are suddenly upended, which is a tough pill to swallow, to realize they are no longer first in line for their parents' attention, as much as their parents still love them. I think we have a little bit of this shocking realization happening in our gospel from Luke this morning. We come into the scene last week at the end of our reading, Jesus was freshly baptized and then we skip over the part where the spirit sends him out into the wilderness where he is tempted and tested by Satan for 40 days. And now he has come back from that time of testing and has entered into public ministry. Word is getting around. He's going throughout Galilee, his native region. He's going to synagogues. People are talking about him. And now he comes home to his hometown of Nazareth and he goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath as was his custom. And he stands up to read the scripture for the day and he unrolls the scroll and he finds this passage from Isaiah which is from Isaiah chapter one. If it sounded familiar when I was reading that quote from Jesus reading it today, it's because we had it back in Advent about six weeks ago, that passage from Isaiah. And Jesus stands up and he reads the scripture, these amazing grace-filled promises about what God is doing in the world, that God has anointed him to bring good news to the poor and to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he reads these words and he rolls up the scroll, which I understand takes some time. You can imagine these long documents. And so he's got to roll it back up and everybody's looking and waiting and watching. And he sits, he hands a scroll back to the attendant and he sits down and he preaches what I think is the, the shortest sermon we have on record from Jesus. One sentence long. Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is Jesus' inaugural sermon, the first one we have written down, declaring here at the start of his ministry what his vision for that ministry is, what his mission is is as the anointed one, what he understands himself to be and what he is to do because God has sent him to do it. Jesus is setting out God's agenda for what Jesus will do as the anointed one. And it is a beautiful, captivating, inspiring plan. And everyone is amazed at the gracious words coming from his mouth. Until, as I imagine it, you know, they get through whatever their service was, and at the end they kind of crowd around Jesus and they're talking to him, and Jesus flips the script. He kind of pushes the envelope. 
he expands his listeners' understanding of what is happening in that scripture and what he meant by saying it has been fulfilled. I think there is kind of this expectation for these people who saw Jesus grow up, who have known him his whole life, that somehow they get the home team advantage. That they will be first in line to receive all of these blessings that Jesus has to offer. And more than that, their self-understanding as the chosen people of God, there is this sense that these good things are promised for them. Maybe not just for them, but at least for them first. They have been waiting for this anointed one for so long, and they're living under occupation, and this promise of liberation and release is so exciting. And Jesus said, well, don't you remember Elijah and Elisha? He reminds them of these two stories from scripture of these long ago prophets, pointing, that, uh, pointing out that sometimes when God sends prophets, he doesn't send them to the people of Israel, but to the Gentiles, to foreigners, to the enemy. If you don't remember who Naaman was, it says Naaman the Syrian, but he was the commander of an enemy army. And God heals these people instead of all of the other widows and all of the other lepers that were in Israel who might have thought that they might get that healing first. And boy, that just stirs up rage. The listeners are so angry at what Jesus has to say that they run him out of town they drive you know they kind of just all in mass you can imagine what that looks like carrying Jesus along to the top of the hill on which their town is built and they want to throw him off a cliff that's quite a way to start your ministry right a one sentence sermon with a little dialogue after gets him sent almost hurtled off a cliff We resonate somewhat, at least I do, with this story. That recognition and realization, I mean, we know that God's gifts just aren't for us. We know that God blesses us so that we may be a blessing, and still sometimes it is a shock to remember that God's agenda is not to take care of us in the inner circle first, but that instead God is anointing us to go out to those who are on the outskirts and the fringes and the margins to seek after those who are in the most urgent need of good news, much as parents do with toddlers and babies, you know, the toddler still gets what they need, but the baby needs them first. And God often wants to do that in our world as well not to tend those who think they need it or deserve it first, but to go after all of those people who seem so far away from God that God wouldn't pay them any attention. But Jesus reminds us that God's love is much more expansive than that in ways that often make us uncomfortable. This love of God for the least and the lost is what sends Jesus to tax collectors and sinners to hang out with them and to eat with them. It's what sends him to heal the sick and give sight to the blind and preach to the crowds out in the countryside instead of just to the religious elite in the temple. If we're honest, we know that we, we wrestle sometimes, at least I do. I mean, I stand up here and preach all the time that God's love is for everyone. And sometimes still, I wanna choose who God gives that love to. There are some that I think, eh, God, I know you love everybody, but why them? There are some we find hard for us to love and thus kind of want to imagine them standing outside of the reach of God's grace and mercy and compassion and forgiveness. It can be hard to share those blessings of God with people we think don't deserve it. But we know that a parent's love, an earthly parent's love for their children isn't finite, right? As a child or as a parent, you know that love for your children grows. 
expands as the family grows and expands. Love multiplies to include a wider and wider circle of people. And it's not just from this person out, it's the love in the circle of those people, right? From child to child and sibling to sibling. And if that is true of us as human families, how much more is that true of God? What we see all throughout scripture, both in the Old Testament and in the New, is that God is always, always on the move to redeem and reclaim and restore the whole world and everyone in it. It's why Jesus comes, sent and anointed by God to reveal God's love, not just to the people of his hometown, not just to his own religion, not just to us and to those who think and believe and act like us, but to all people. Jesus' message, his whole life is meant to reveal and to share the truth about God's grace, this free gift of God's love, that it is extended to everyone even the people we think God should find it impossible to love. Jesus comes to remind us that there is always enough of God's love to go around. It is a love that was fierce enough that it was willing to die even for those who want to keep it for themselves. It is a love so powerful that it overcomes hate and jealousy and fear and shame and rises from the grave never to die again. It is this love that lives in us, that has been planted in our hearts, that calls us into new life and into a new way of living. Because it anoints us too as fellow proclaimers of this good news and sends us to share God's love with everyone, especially with those who seem to deserve it the least and need it the most. And for this multiplying, expanding, never-ending, life-changing, world-changing love of God, we say thanks be to God. Amen.